Drew and Davies. Woo, festive. Also, my album Ear Candy comes out next month. We're getting closer. We're getting yeah, closer. Yeah, Finally, great. gonna give you guys a package. You guys don't have to great listen conclusion. to Cherry Soda on repeat anymore. <laughs> but yeah, like I've said before, there will be an Ear Candy album movie here on this channel. It'll premiere live. And the album cover is officially released. Drum roll, please. Things are brand princess. The album cover is actually on my Instagram. I'm not going to show it in this video. We're almost at 100,000 on Instagram. So that would be plug. amazing if you guys could go follow it. And also, in news of the channel, we actually hit 100 million views. Things tier one looter. Give it up for us, man. In we did that. 100 million views in total on this Vanilla. channel. Thank you guys so much. That's a lot of people looking at me, judging me behind the screen. I know you judge me behind the screen. Do you guys remember my hard drive video that I released, like, I think two or three weeks ago? Well, I got limited ads. Boom. I'm not going to make a big deal out of that, but I will say a big thank you to today's sponsor. A lot of my videos just get straight limited Do I ads. check the NORAD so Santa Tracker? for companies that want to sponsor the channel. And today's sponsor is... Casetify. Casetify is the world's most popular tech accessory brand known for the protective phone cases made from 65% recycled No, it's about evil musicians, so it's going to be their crimes, not their shitty music. Well, I don't even Casetify know if all the music is shitty. I found a wide range of case types that Johnny offer high levels of protection, style, and sleekness. The bounce case offers world-class protection with Casetify's EcoShock Impact Absorption Here's Technology. Here. These cases are test dropped 156 times to ensure they can handle everything life has to offer. No, I don't the clear the case offers a sleek look for your devices with its clear back and slim form factor providing you with a low profile. Unlike other cheaper TPU cases, Casetify's clear cases are optimized to prevent yellowing. The Impact Series is a great combination of the two, offering a slimmer profile than the bounce weed. case, but still being tested from drops of 11 and a half feet. Casetify has also recently launched their artist program, where they partnered with exclusive artists to offer more than 2,000 prints to choose from for your case. You can express yourself however you want to. Didn't we oh, watch yeah. this? No, he just posted this. You can attach to your phone. I just Casetify made a I made a video on the to me, and I've most been using evil while musician I genuinely ever. Love this brand and it actually has saved my phone a couple times. Make sure to go so to caseify.com slash tub today to get 15% off your order. Thanks again to Caseify for sponsoring this video. Alright, now let's get started with the video. Sid Vicious John Simon Ritchie, better known by his stage name Sid Vicious, was an English musician, best known as the bassist for punk rock band Sex Pistols. Despite dying oh. in 1979 at age 21, he remains an that. icon to some of the punk subculture. To say John had a troubled childhood would be an understatement. He was raised by a single mother who sold marijuana to get by. <coughs> she later remarried and John now had a stepdad, but sadly, that man passed away six months later due to kidney failure. By the time John was 15, his mother's life was consumed by a heroin and opiate addiction, causing oh. him to feel lonelier than ever. While attending Kingsway College of Further Education, which was a school for students with difficulties, John admitted to a counselor that he had thoughts of and that he would torture and kill cats in his free time. That same year, Richie met fellow Kingsway student John Ladon, who introduced him to his friends John Gray and John Wardle. All four, who became known locally as the Four Johns, quit school and began squatting in various dismal locations. Three of the Four These Johns would then one. take nicknames. Lydon gave Richie the nickname Sid Vicious after Richie was bitten by Lydon's hamster, Sid. Two years later in 1975, Glenn Matlock and Paul Cook joined the band now rebranded to Sex Pistols. Though Richie still wasn't a part of the band, it wasn't until 1977 that tensions started rising between member Matlock and their manager Malcolm McLaren, which led to Matlock being kicked from their band for, quote, liking the Beatles. The work environment was pretty toxic, with Matlock revealing that their manager what? purposely made them pick fights with each other because he thought generating chaos between the band was a creative mechanism. Anyway, this is when John Ritchie, aka Sid Vicious, would finally join Sex Pistols and become their new bassist. Just a year later, on October 11th, 1978, Sid and his then-girlfriend, Nancy Spungen, hosted a party in their hotel room, during which Vicious took approximately 30 2-inal tablets, and while many people came and went, he was comatose for the rest of the night. At about 11 a.m. the next morning, hotel staff found Spungen dead on the bathroom floor, with a knife wound in her abdomen. Vicious oh, was found Christ. wandering the hallway. He first claimed to have killed her, then said he remembered nothing. Two people who had been at the party stated that Nancy was alive at 5 a.m. The murder weapon was identified as a Jaguar K-11 hunting knife, which Nancy had purchased for Sid a few days earlier. Vicious was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He told police that he and Nancy had argued that night, but gave conflicting versions of what happened next, saying, I stabbed her, but I never meant to kill her, then saying that he didn't remember anything. Then after that, saying that Spongen had fallen onto the knife. Later, the yeah, this kind of shit happened. Like, he mentioned the torturing and killing cats. That's where it always starts for a murderer. Or, I guess, like a, like a full-blown, like, psychopath fucking maniac. That is like the number one sign that someone will end up doing that to a real person. Torturing, killing animals. 
That is just the most common thread. I think the second that gets mentioned, they need to take that very seriously and monitor the person. There needs to be some very serious repercussions for that shit. That is just like the most cited correlation ever. Like an early sign of someone who will likely be a murderer. Makes no sense why it's still not taken super seriously. A lack of respect for life. I think it's still just that notion that, oh, it's just an animal. That's a huge distinction. He's just doing it to cats right now. He'll never graduate and do that to people, surely. But, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of killers. All, and very many of them, have no problem being open that it started when they were kids with torturing and killing animals. I, I just don't know, like, how much more evidence they need of that being a telltale sign. Is there some kumquat and baby whale? The arresting officer the was quoted as having said, After IBT an investigation, and Vicious and admitted Risa killing Marion a sponge Hawk, during a dispute. Connor. Though the situation was a bit hard to get out of because Richie admitted to stabbing her, his manager, his mother, and his label were able to get a top-tier lawyer which arranged for Richie to be released on a $50,000 bail, with conditions that he wouldn't leave New York and that he'd sign in daily at the 3rd Homicide Unit offices. All legal costs were covered by Virgin Records. Just two months later, Richie found himself in another case when he was flirting with Todd Smith girlfriend. No, not that Todd Smith. But he was flirting with a man's girlfriend, and when Smith told him to back off, well, Richie broke a beer bottle and jammed it into his face, leading to Smith getting five stitches and Richie being arrested and charged with assault. In Jesus January 1979, Christ. Richie would be released on a $10,000 bail. In the morning of February 1st, 1979, after completing his detoxification program, Richie was released from Rikers Island Jail. When he arrived in Manhattan, he met his friend Peter Gravel. Vicious asked Gravel to find him some heroin, and Gravel brought two $200 worth of the drug to the apartment. Gravel said that they sat around doing drugs and he left at 3 a.m. when the hard drug use began. He noted that Vicious was already nodding off, but he also said that Robinson, which was another friend of theirs, gave Vicious four quaaludes to help him sleep. Vicious died that night of a drug overdose. Deborah Spungen, who was Nancy's mother, claimed that Vicious wrote a letter to her when he was hospitalized saying, we always knew that we would go to the same place when we died. We so much wanted to die together in each other's arms. I cry oh, every time maniac. I think about that. I promised my baby I would kill myself if anything ever happens to her, and she promised me the same. This is my final commitment to my love. No one's ever gonna know if Richie actually overdosed on purpose to meet Nancy ultra. again, or if he genuinely accidentally overdosed. Chuck Berry Charles Edward Anderson Berry was an American singer, songwriter, and guitarist who pioneered rock and roll. Nicknamed the father of rock and roll, he refined and developed rhythm and blues into major elements that made rock and roll distinctive with songs such as Maybelline, Roll Over Beethoven, Rock and Roll Music, and Johnny B. Good, which was featured on the classic Back to the Future. Writing lyrics that- I'll be honest, on the main thing I know Chuck Berry for is that performance with John Lennon where Yoko starts banging a drum and making outrageous noises into a mic and he looks extremely shocked and uncomfortable. That's like the most I know about Chuck Berry. And then I also know the Bill Burr seg segment on that interaction. Iconic clip though. It goes on for like three minutes. What? The Yoko Ono screaming? No. That went on for only like... Fuck, probably only like 30-45 seconds before they cut her mic. But it's enough to be traumatizing to listen to. Show the clip. I highly doubt I can show that clip on Twitch. That would get my shit DMCA'd so quick. Chuck Berry and John Lennon? Are you serious? And Yoko Ono. Well, uh, Yoko Ono doesn't even know what the internet is. Yoko Ono still does that shtick. She's lived her whole life around this idea that people like to hear her make goofy noises. I will never forget that, I think it was 2016, 2015, she went to like an art museum and had her own exhibit where she just grabs a mic and goes, <laughs> for like five minutes. Yoko doesn't know what the fuck the internet is. 
impacts on rock music. Though he's seen as a legend by many, the fact that he's a predator and full-on creep seems to be forgotten. Well after his peak fame, when Charles was 61 in 1987, he was charged with assaulting a woman at New York's Gramercy Park Hotel. He was accused of causing lacerations to the mouth requiring five stitches, two loose teeth, and constusions of the face. Jesus he pleaded Christ. guilty to a lesser charge of harassment and paid a $250 fine. Three years later in 1990, he was sued by several women who claimed that he had installed a video camera in the bathroom of his restaurant. Barry claimed that he had the camera installed to catch a worker who was suspected of stealing from the restaurant. Although his guilt what? was never proven in court, Barry opted for a class action settlement. One of his biographers, Bruce Pegg, estimated that it cost Barry over $1.2 million plus legal fees. His lawyers claimed that he had been a victim of conspiracy to profit from his wealth. Reportedly, a police raid on his house found intimate videotapes of women, one of whom was apparently a minor. Also found in the raid Jesus were 62 Christ. grams of marijuana. Felony drug and abuse charges were filed and the abuse charges were eventually dropped, and Barry agreed to plead guilty to misdemeanor possession of marijuana. He was given a six-month suspended jail sentence placed on two years unsupervised probation and was ordered to donate $5,000 to a local hospital. Still don't know why the abuse charges were dropped, even though there was apparently a video. Later videos Barry recorded of himself urinating on a woman and another of her defecating on him would surface. And one of the- Whoa! Wait, this guy was like the- like, original R. Kelly pisser. He recorded a video of him pissing on a woman? Like, ten years before R. Kelly did. Maybe R. Kelly was inspired? Interesting. The defecating, I don't think R. Kelly ever did. I don't think he ever got shit on by a woman. Well, he, he may have, I have no fucking idea. But that was never in any of the court documents. So he didn't want to go full Chuck Berry. It was a half measure. There's a tier one sergeant and the five gift subs destroyer. Thank you, destroyer. And the prime grit and resub brain. John McAfee. Yeah, I still don't know if that one's true, but I still just love the, uh, the mythos around that. It was rumored that John McAfee would hire prostitutes to sit in this special swing he made that had the ass cut out of it so that way he could lay under it and they'd shit on him. That was a kind of wild theory. Don't know if it's true. There's a lot of uh, mystique around the life of John McAfee. There's really no telling for sure what's real and what's fake. I, I, I don't remember if we asked him that on the podcast or not. I don't think so. This is old lore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone just brought up John McAfee. So I was just explaining why. This is a tier one destroyer. Things are some stinky. You asked about the whale thing? Yeah, we asked him if he actually had sex with a whale, which he denies. But I don't remember if, I don't remember us asking about a shit fetish. Thanks to the Prime Cup and the Resub P and Nate. Oh, what is it with celebrities and shit piss fetishes? I don't fucking know, man. I'm not their sex therapist. I have no clue. If you want me to take like an uneducated stab at it, I'd say it's probably because they reach this level of wealth and fame where they have everything. So the only thing left to give them some kind of thrill is the most deplorable shit. I don't know. There's Reese Foxy in the Prime Dirty. This videos is, uh, it's on Reddit. Doesn't show that much, but you can hear a Chuck Berry fart and then ask, did I fart in your face? Not gonna play the audio, oh, but what? it's pretty no. odd and wild stuff. Nonetheless, the- You, you can't tease me with that, Tuv. What? Say, say that again? Face. On Reddit, doesn't show a woman and another of her defecating on him would surface. And one of those videos is, uh, it's on Reddit. Doesn't show that much, but you can hear a Chuck Berry fart and then ask, did I fart in your face? <laughs> Not gonna play the audio, but it's pretty odd and wild stuff. <laughs> Nonetheless, the dude was a fucking cr Okay, hold on. Just pulling that up. This is called Classic Video Chuck Berry Farts on Prostitute. 
Okay, I don't know how crude the audio is, so I'm going to mute for a second and listen to this. Hundreds of hours. Yes, yep. So. That was hype. That was a lot cooler than I thought it was going to be, too. It's not muted. Well, you're welcome, then. How about that? That was hype. The video had, like, his legs over his head. <laughs> it was like the fart was aimed at her face. Fucking weirdo bad guy, though. Interesting fart, though. Creep. And he died on my birthday, March 18th, 2017. He died due to a cardiac arrest. It's so annoying that his music is built in all Teslas on their little Christmas mode. Hey, Elon, this dude was a full-on predator. That, it does seem, does seem that Bard way. Goldvik Ethan, a.k.a. Faust, is a Norwegian drummer known primarily for his work with the black metal band Emperor. In 1993, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison for, get this, murder. He's been out of prison since 2003, but according to Ethan, while walking home from a pub through the Olympic Park, a well-known gay cruising spot, a man named Andresen, drunkenly approached him and solicited him for sex. Ethan agreed to go with him to the nearby woods, and there he stabbed Andresen 37 times. Ethan claimed that he felt no remorse at the time. Ethan, his bandmate and emperor, said that Ethan, quote, had been very fascinated by serial killers for a long time, and I guess he wanted to know what it's like to kill a person. The media has linked the murder to black metal, and speculated that Ethan was motivated by Satanism, fascism, or homophobia. In a 1993 interview, he stated, I am not a Satanist, but I praise the evil. In an interview for the book Lords of Chaos, he explained that he had been interested in Satanism, but there are other things as well. Basically, I don't give a shit. In a 2008 interview, Which one's the one that's, uh, what is it, the Church of Satan? I don't remember. One of those that's called Satanism or something to do with Satan is actually just kind of about, like, Loving yourself or some shit? I don't think it's this one. Whatever this guy's talking about. But which one is that? Oh, the Satanic Temple. Ah, uh, okay. The Satanic Temple. Yeah, because that one is apparently just all about, like, self-love and not worrying about, like, greater powers. Something like that. Thanks, Arisa, Milky, and Pupil. Ethan said, I was never a Satanist or a fascist in any way. In a 2012 interview, he said, I never had any racist or homophobic views. Gal, who was an openly gay member of the Norwegian black metal scene, said that Ethan was the first person to send him a message of support when he came out. Police initially had no suspects, and Ethan remained free for about a year. However, he told Oystein Euronymous Arseth, Varg Vikernes, and a few others what he had done. Damn, those After names Vikernes are crazy. After Oystein murder in 1993, which we will talk about next, Ethan was arrested and confessed to killing Andresen. In 1994, he was sentenced to 14 years imprisonment, but was released due to good behavior in 2003 after serving 9 years and 4 months. Isn't that wild? Murder is still something that you can just serve your time and come back from? I guess maybe there was some level of rehab at that particular prison. I That'd have to be some fucking crazy rehab. Guy just randomly murders someone. I don't, I don't really know how you've... How you solve that problem. But then there's people that have marijuana charges that will never see the light of day again. Apparently marijuana is something you can never rehab out of. Isn't that fucking crazy? Yeah, true. I guess maybe it's just a, something with the prison system over there that's different here. I don't know. Still, though, I just find that to just be very sad. and four months. 
Varg v Kernes. Now the Mayhem Band is a topic you guys have requested a lot, but I honestly don't think I'm going to make a dedicated video to them anytime soon. There are some great documentaries here on YouTube all about that. However, I will talk about Varg v Kernes, the 1993 to 1994 bass player for the band. On June 6, 1992, the Fantov Stave Church, dating from the 12th century and considered architecturally significant, was burned to the ground by arson. The cover of Burzum's EP, Ashes, is a photo of the destroyed church. By January 1993, arson attacks had occurred on at least seven other major staved churches, including one on Christmas Thanks, Eve Chris. of 1992. He was found guilty of several of these cases. At the time, media outlets reported that he was associated with some type of Satanism. In later interviews, Vicarinus, Man, that satanic panic was in full effect. Arsons, said they weren't satanic, but instead revenge for the Christian desecration of Viking graves and temples. According what? to him, the arsons were on the anniversary of the Lindis Farn Viking raid. He claimed that all the burnings except for one were done by one person. In early 1993, problems came between him and Euronymous, which was the band's lead guitarist, which ended up in Euronymous's murder. It's been speculated that the murder was a result of a power struggle or a financial dispute, or maybe even an attempt at outdoing the stabbing by Faust. On the night of the murder, Vikernes and Blackthorn drove from Bergen to Euronymous's apartment at Toyangata and also, Blackthorn allegedly stood in the stairwell smoking while Vikernes went to Euronymous's apartment on the fourth floor. Vikernes said he met Euronymous at the door. Jesus, this is so much to keep track of. Holy shit. forward and confronted Euronymous, Euronymous panicked and kicked him in the chest. Vikernes claims Euronymous ran to the kitchen to fetch a knife. The two got into a struggle and Vikernes stabbed Euronymous to death. His body was found in the stairwell on the first floor with 23 stab wounds, two to the head, five yeah, to the sounds neck, like self-defense to me. To the back. After the murder, Vikernes and Blackthorn drove back to Bergen. On the way, they stopped at a lake where Vikernes disposed of his blood-stained clothes. Vikernes was arrested on August 19, 1993 in Bergen. The police found 150 kilograms of explosives and 3,000 rounds of ammunition in his home. On May 16, 1994, Fuck, Vikernes was Jesus sentenced Christ. to 21 years in prison, Norway's maximum penalty. The murder of Euronymous, the arson of three churches, the attempted arson of a fourth church, and for the theft and storage of 150 50 kilograms of explosives. Though Vikernes only confessed to the theft and storage of the explosives, two churches were set on fire the day he was sentenced. Vikernes continued with his band Burzum, which included one other member, Samoth, after his release. He released three further black metal albums, Bellis in 2010, Fallen in 2011, and Um Skip Tar in 2012, and a compilation of re-recorded songs. In the years following his release from prison, Vikernes <laughs> became an oh, active Jesus. video blogger on his YouTube channel, which was called Thulian Perspective. But you to remove his channel from the platform in June 2019. But by that point, the channel had 250,000 subscribers. So there's a chance if he redeemed the 100,000 subscriber play button that YouTube gave a murderer a play button. I'm talking about a murderer Huge. that already killed someone. Not like a YouTuber that ended up killing someone. Like They, they rewarded a murderer with a 100k play button. <laughs> Well, that's Johnny two Cash. people here that are now out after murdering somebody. Huge. Wow. 80 tier 1 platonic and the resub licked doge in the prime line. And the resub Natanata. Yeah, I, they must have been, they must have been real lax on that. Thanks, the resub penguin. Johnny Cash was an American country singer-songwriter. Much of Cash's music contained themes of sorrow, moral tribulation, and redemption, especially in the later stages of his career. He was known for his deep, calming voice. Kind of like, uh, kind of like me. In Los Angeles in the summer of 1965, Johnny Pretty Cash cool. was living in the wilderness of Southern California oh, was that a G -flat? when he sparked a wildfire with his overheated truck. It blazed through more than 500 Holy acres shit. and threatened the lives of endangered condors. This took the lives of 49 condors and there were only 53 condors in that entire forest. Sad because in 1987, the California condor was officially declared extinct in the wild and it's safe to assume Johnny Cash had a lot to do with it. When asked by a judge if he started the fire, he said, my truck did, and it's dead. 
so you can't question it. He ended up settling the case for $82,000, or about half a million in today's dollars. When held That's legally responsible by investigators, Cash made lovely statements such as, I don't care about your damn yellow buzzards. Yeah, he was definitely feeling pretty remorseful. If you guys are looking for ways to support the channel know, other than just watching the videos, what a piece I of shit! Wow. Already enough, thank you so much. You can also buy I like from Johnny the Cash brand. music. The website is I know he's such a douche. And we currently have our Christmas collection. You can follow us over on Instagram as hey. well. Hey, exist. We have a new comic. We upload a lot of comics, so if you wanna go see the Adventures of Earl, you can go check it out. Everything from the Christmas collection will leave on New Year's. So these are very limited. We're never gonna sell these again. Next year it'll be different Christmas Thanks, collection. Steve. These Good designs to see, man. Hope you're doing are happy. limited. Yeah, if you want to support the channel, if you want to look cool, Georgia. if you want to get a special gift for a special someone, make sure to shop at Earl Doesn't Exist. Sucks, but it's not murder. Oh, yeah, well, yeah it's definitely way, not guys, murder. Make sure to use code EARL20. I mean, I guess it is murder. Off 49 condors. This will expire on January 1st. Not now, intentionally, but next topic. still. Ozzy Osbourne. John Michael Ozzy Osbourne is an English <laughs> singer, songwriter, and television personality. He rose to prominence during the 1970s as the lead vocalist of the heavy metal band Black Sabbath. On February 19th, 1982, Osbourne had a few too many drinks and ended up stumbling on the street in nothing but his girlfriend's dress. He was in a dress because she hid all his clothing in order so that he wouldn't go out anymore, but Ozzy being Ozzy, he just put on her dress and left. <laughs> He ended up taking a leak and thought nothing of it, and it was later revealed that Ozzy peed within the Alamo Plaza, not the Alamo itself, but still pretty disrespectful as it's quite literally nicknamed- I actually remember this. It holds this status because it represents I remember this the story. Battle of Alamo, which was a pivotal event in the Texas Revolution following a 13-day battle where Mexican troops reclaimed the mission, killing most of the occupants inside. Police arrested Ozzy, who spent part of the afternoon in a local jail on charges of public intoxication. He was later freed that evening on a four $40 bond and performed at the city's Hemisphere Arena Convention Center. This also led Amy. to him being banned from playing in San Antonio, Texas for 10 years. Once those 10 years were up, a sober Ozzy came back and gave a proper apology. What? Are they speaking through a waterfall? What is that? DMX. Oh. On July 1st, 2004, at 8 p.m., DMX, whose real name was Earl Simmons, and his friend Thanks were at the book. JFK airport, specifically in the parking lot for terminals in 1, Venom. 2, and 3. Allegedly in a hurry, DMX and his accomplice were becoming irritated with the speed of the car in front of them, so DMX turned on the siren lights of his Ford Expedition. Why he had siren lights? I don't even know. DMX pulled That's the so hype over, though. and keep in mind, what? the dude was with his wife and his daughter. DMX told the guy that he and his friend were FBI agents and attempted to drag him out of his own car. After failing to do so, How do DMX returned to his vehicle and crashed through a gate, where he was then arrested by poor authority police and found with multiple rocks of crack cocaine. DMX and his friend, whose name is Jackie Hudgens, were charged with cocaine possession, criminal impersonation, criminal possession of a weapon, criminal mischief, driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, also for claiming being a federal agent and attempting to carjack a vehicle. The victim was originally seeking compensation in the amount of $4 million from DMX. DMX's attorney, Rich Cord, spoke on behalf of his client, explaining that the rapper felt he was justified in pulling the victim over and making a citizen's arrest. He went on to say, <laughs> his vehicle looked like it was a police vehicle and he believed the victim should have gotten out of the way. When the victim didn't get out of his way, he decided he should pull him over. He read What the fuck? This is the... There's no, I, there's no way this works. It's, first of all, it's illegal to impersonate a police vehicle. You can't even have sirens. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, that's already a crime. Like, a literal crime. I do love the excuse, though, that he actually wasn't trying to, like, steal their car. It was a citizen's arrest. I like that. That's an interesting angle. I like that one. That's good RP. You can buy sirens but can't use them. I don't even know where the fuck you can get sirens. I, th I thought it was literally illegal to have sirens on top of your car unless you are a police officer. You can't flash red and blues. You can have, of course, like the... Like, uh, workers' lights and all of that, but you can't... You cannot flash red and blues. I think that's literally illegal. Amazon. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you can get like toy ones and slap them up there. Thanks to the resub Cobra Molnui, Molnir and Champ. It's 
it's illegal to do, but you can still stall LED lights? Well, yeah, you can still have, like, some kind of lights. I'm, I'm saying you cannot be, like, siren. You cannot... I don't even think you can have fucking red or blue headlights for that very reason. Am I right or wrong with that? You cannot flash anything red or blue because you cannot be mistaken for a law enforcement officer. It's illegal. Jeremy DeWitt alert. True. Classic Jeremy. Thanks, Arisa Bora. Fucking hype, though, that for some reason he had law enforcement sirens for his vehicle. That's cool, I guess. <laughs> DMX was just above the law. He was the law. But he flew a little too close to the sun with all the crack and then trying to arrest someone. Oh, that's not what he was trying to do. But I do like the angle of the citizen's arrest is trying to get him out of the charge. Billy admits to making believe he was an FBI agent and telling the victim to get out of the car. He denies striking him or trying to pull him out of the car. DMX was given a conditional discharge on December 8, 2004, but pleaded guilty on October 25, 2005 to violating parole. Here's a clip of DMX talking about it on The Breakfast Club in 2012. I was, I was rushing for a flight. Mm -hmm. Right. And this dude in the raggedy ass Honda, he driving wild slow. Right. Now, usually if I'm in a rush, you know what I'm saying, and I'm in that truck, I'll hit the lights and, you know, throw the siren or whatever, and they get out the way. Right. But he was just totally disrespecting my authority. Not that I really... What authority? I But what if I really did have the authority? Right. So you threw the light on. Yeah, I threw the light on. So you yeah. just have sirens in your car. Well, that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that one, yeah. <laughs> that made, that, I think that made you feel like you had more authority than you actually had. <laughs> what the Rick James. James Ambrose... What the f... It sounds like they actually just gave him a law enforcement unmarked vehicle. What the fuck you mean? I just threw on the sirens. That's... That's so wild. Uh, yeah, I mean, at that point, goddamn, he, he basically was just like an unsworn in officer. Thanks to the resub Mitch in Teriyaki. The bits Eliza. Johnson Jr. was an DMX American his singer, own songwriter, musician, and record producer. Born and raised in Buffalo, New York, James began his musical career in his teenage years. I he only know Rick James from Chappelle the Show. Navy Reserve to avoid being drafted into the army. In 1964, oh, I also know his iconic interview where he's like, "Cocaine's a hell of a drug." <laughs> That's it. That's all I know about Rick James. What do the five fingers say to the face? Slap. Charlie Murphy. Man, this has been a night of, like, remembering old Chappelle show moments. That show was so good back in the day. Fuck me. I'm Rick James, bitch. I know literally nothing about his music or him as a person, though. James deserted to Toronto, Canada, where he formed the rock band The Minor Birds, who eventually signed a recording deal with Motown Records in 1966. Johnson's career with the group halted after military authorities discovered his whereabouts and eventually convicted him of desertion-related charges. He served a few months in jail. After being released, Johnson moved to California, where he started a variety of rock and funk groups in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In 1977, James finally found success as a recording artist after signing with Motown's Gordy Records. Releasing the album Come Get It in 1978, which produced the hits You and I and Mary Jane. In 1981, James released his most successful album, Street Songs, which included career-defining hits such as Give It To Me Baby and Super Freak. By the wait, 1990s, what? Whoa, the drug wait. Rick James is Super Freak? Oh, okay. So I definitely know of his music. I just didn't know it was him that made it. Oh, I had no clue. I love that song. That song went so hard. Thanks for some... Karsten, Drag, Mitch, and the bit Smokey. Early January Smokey. Abuse was public knowledge. He was heavily addicted to cocaine and later admitted to spending $7,000 a week on cocaine for five years straight. Cocaine's on a August hell of a 2nd, drug. 1991, James and his girlfriend Tanya Hijazi were arrested on charges of holding 24 year old Frances Ali hostage for up to six days, tying her up, forcing her to perform sexual acts, and burning her legs and abdomen with the hot end of a crack cocaine pipe. All oh, of this fuck, during a Jesus week long Christ. cocaine binge. Ultimately, James untied the victim and she fled his house. 
eventually checking in to Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, where her injuries were brought to the attention of police, and her story unfolded from there. Sadly, many of the allegations made by Ali were not upheld. Due to his strong legal defense team, James managed to avoid life imprisonment after being cleared of the torture charge. You see, this is only one of the many stories when it comes to Rick James being a horrible person. And it didn't seem like Rick James was apologetic, as when another one of his victims was recounting what she went through with him, he was seen audibly snoring in the courthouse. Other stories include what? minors, which I'd rather not talk about. This is another one of holy those things shit. that people just seem to not talk about. Oh, holy Frank fuck. Sinatra. There is a very Frank, famous picture what? of Francis what? Albert Sinatra. AKA Frank Sinatra. This image is the infamous Damn, I didn't know half of these. photo, I only knew a and who would have thought that one of the world's best-selling music artists arrest was, well, for a crime that doesn't even exist anymore. And what was that crime, you may ask? Seduction. This charge was usually applied when a man convinced an unmarried woman of good repute to engage in an inappropriate encounter with him. There was generally a promise of marriage that would never actually come true, thereby ruining the woman's charge. reputation. It was basically when a man would lie to a woman of high standards in order to fuck her, usually promising marriage. In other words, the official crime for all the 1930s busters with Riz. <laughs> Oh <laughs> Damn, God. this man actually caught a Giga Chad charge. 23-year-old Sinatra found himself in that situation, and he was officially arrested and booked for seduction. The charge was eventually dropped, and it was later discovered that the supposedly single woman was in fact married. Later that year, the original charge was revised slightly, and Sinatra was again arrested, this time for adultery. Adultery is legal punishment for cheating on your spouse whom you're married to. It's a really outdated law, which some states are actively trying to get rid of. These states include Alabama. Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Kansas, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, New York, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Utah, Virginia, so like all the states. and Wisconsin. I mean, this is a pretty lighthearted one on the list. I know the woman still cheated, and I feel bad for whoever her husband was, but imagine if this mugshot was for something way more heinous. Imagine it was like Frank Sinatra mugshot for robbing blind old lady then pushing her in front of a semi-truck. <laughs> it, just, it just wouldn't feel right. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad it wasn't anything too bad from Frank Sinatra. What an actual wild charge. There was a time where it was illegal to have game. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Hey, sorry to hear about that, Sinatra. But also, congrats and good work. Elvis Presley. Elvis Aaron Presley was an American singer and actor, dubbed the king of rock and roll. He's regarded as one of the most significant cultural figures of the 20th century. His energized interpretations of songs and sexually provocative performance style led him to both great success and initial controversy. He became insanely famous with Heartbreak Hotel, which was his first number one hit being released in January 1956, and he quickly became a star. In Joel Williamson's book, Elvis Presley, A Southern Life, he writes about Elvis's life on the road including his time spent with teenagers. Williamson wrote that while on tour, Elvis preyed on a group of three 14-year-old girls who would pull oh, a fight, Jesus tickle, Christ. wrestle, and kiss Elvis, who was 22 at the time. He also met his wife when he was 24. She was 14. Though they got married oh, when Jesus she was 21, Christ. they claimed they never had sex. This has been questioned by many many people even to the point where a book has been written about it multiple books actually now elvis was never charged with anything regarding these relationships but he should have been and i'm sure we can all agree on that i never heard Thank that you guys god so damn for watching the, the video fuck? if you liked it make sure to leave a like and if you're new to the channel make sure to subscribe also go follow me on instagram we're almost at hundred thousand followers and make sure to go and buy some amazing clothing Jacob at and and oh merry yeah christmas and your candy is out next month merry christmas happy hanukkah happy kwanzaa and all the other holidays and happy new year in case this is my last video of the year i hope it's not but in case it is and i'll see you guys next time i upload nice yeah i didn't know most of those i am surprised you didn't Put in Ian Watkins. Ian Watkins, what he did is still worse than everything on this list. His entire musical career, everything he did behind the scenes is...